There's a simple explanation for why barns are painted red. When farmers were picking out colors, they went with the cheapest paint. But why is red paint so inexpensive? To understand that, you have to travel to the heart of a dying star. No, really. I'm Sophie, and welcome to The Countdown. As Google employee Yonatan Zunger explained online, the element iron lends a rusty red color to pigments like the commonly used red ochre. And iron is abundant enough to reduce the cost of red paint. This supply is entirely due to nuclear fusion in aging stars. As a star gets older, it begins to form heavier and heavier elements, until it's making atoms whose nuclei contain a total of 56 protons and neutrons. At this point, the atoms stop growing. The star continues making only elements whose protons and neutrons add up to 56, which happens to include the most common form of iron. Because of fusion and dying stars, we have a surplus of iron, which gives us lots of red pigments, which drives down the price of red paint. And that, my friends, is why barns are red. Crowdsourcing isn't just for funding your line of handmade baby clothes. A group of researchers is going to the crowd to study light pollution. The Globe at Night project uses human observations to measure the amount of artificial light being scattered in the atmosphere. The project's findings, which were published this week in Scientific Reports, show that the naked eye can accurately quantify light pollution. This data could be used to guide lighting policy and technology. Participants in the study received star charts showing constellations at varying brightnesses. By comparing what they observed to the charts, they could accurately report the visible brightness of stars in their location. Citizen scientists were asked to watch the night sky when the moon was absent and record the amount of cloud cover. These factors are known to affect the visibility of stars. You can find out more and participate at globeatnight.org. Did you remember to celebrate your mother last weekend? Because the sun certainly did. An X-class solar flare, which is the most intense kind, erupted on Mother's Day. About 14 hours later, we saw an even more powerful blast. And nine hours after that one, the third and strongest flare erupted. These flares are the gnarliest solar activity recorded so far this year. Luckily for us, none of them pointed toward Earth. But they still managed to cause an hour-long radio blackout in the higher frequencies. Had they been directed toward us, the flares could have triggered an even worse blackout, as well as damaging satellites and disrupting communications and GPS signals. Scientists think these solar tantrums may be a sign of more activity to come. How did the moon wind up with traces of water? A new study in the journal Science suggests Earth and its satellite received their H2O from the same place. To find out where the moon's water originated, researchers looked at the ratio of hydrogen to the hydrogen isotope deuterium, or heavy hydrogen. When they analyzed moon rocks retrieved during the Apollo missions, the scientists found an isotopic ratio similar to the ratio in Earth water. The finding proves H2O came to Earth and the moon from a common source. Interestingly, the isotopic ratio of water in both locations also matches the ratio measured in ancient meteorites. This finding supports the grand tack model of our solar system's formation. According to the theory, Jupiter traveled towards the inner solar system in its youth, which shook up asteroid orbits and may have turned them into building blocks for the young Earth, and eventually its moon. An isolated reservoir 2.4 kilometers below the Earth's surface may contain the oldest water on the planet. The rocks around the liquid are about 2.64 billion years old, and a paper in Nature suggests the water itself has been around for at least 1.5 billion years, and very likely more. Researchers estimated the water's age by analyzing noble gases dissolved in the liquid. In addition, the ancient oasis contains methane and hydrogen, which may be providing energy for microscopic life. After all, the sunless ocean waters around hydrothermal vents contain a similar quantity of hydrogen, and they support a diverse array of microbial organisms. If microbes do live in the reservoir, they haven't touched the outside world for billions of years. This would make them invaluable to the scientists who study evolution, 
And they could hint at the possibility of life on Mars. If Earth's crust can preserve a life-supporting environment below the surface for billions of years, then other planets should be able to do the same. Perhaps the Mars rovers should ditch their drills and start digging deeper. And that's your countdown. Links to all of these stories are in the description below. Also, don't forget to visit the Space Lab channel on YouTube and subscribe. For Scientific American, I'm Sophie Bushwick. And now here's our favorite star man, Commander Chris Hadfield, singing us out with Space Oddity in space. This is ground control to Major Tom.